Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Let us worship God as we sing our hymn, hymn number 399, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We're called to our prayer of confession by the words of the epistle writer to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sinning. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us now pray together our corporate prayer of confession, which will be followed by solid confession of our sins. Let us pray together. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and the desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. 
These words are words of encouragement to us. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ makes intercession for us. As we confess our sins and are forgiven by the power of our Lord, we are indeed new creatures. The past is finished and gone. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Be seated. At this time, it is our privilege to participate in the commissioning of our new Stephen ministers. Some years ago, this congregation made a commitment to participate in this ecumenical program, a program began in the Lutheran, which began in the Lutheran Church, but which is now in thousands of congregations across this country. And so lay leaders were sent for training to be Stephen ministers in the tradition of the biblical character Stephen out of the Acts of the Apostles. And we have trained Stephen minister leaders and those who have been trained as caregivers. This Sunday, we commission several new caregivers as Stephen ministers. And to lead us in this commissioning are three of the five Stephen leaders, all lay people, a commitment is made uh, for two years to be a Stephen minister, and one undergoes 50 hours of training. And so to lead us in the commissioning this Sunday are Mary Fant, Mike Austin, and Sam Burgess. Jerry Dearborn is absent because of the severe illness of her father in Salisbury, and Carl Hurley is absent because of recovery from foot surgery. But we now are privileged to participate in the commissioning of our new Stephen ministers. <coughs> New Stephen ministers, please come forward as your names are called. Helen Ayers, Mariana Person, Margaret Toman, and Dr. James Wright. we begin this commissioning service, let us do so by hearing the word of God. From the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Therefore, beloved, as God's chosen ones, put on compassion and kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, and above all these, put on love. Each of you knows of the comfort of God through the good news of Jesus' life and death for you. As Stephen ministers, you are charged to join in the task of service to our Lord and service to those people in our congregation and our neighborhood who also need to be comforted. As Christ has responded to your needs, it will be important for you to consciously strive to increase your own sensitivity and your responsiveness to the needs of others. As the Lord Jesus Christ took the burdens of the world on his shoulders, and has been a friend to you in troubled times. You are to be a friend to those who are burdened under the stress of daily life. As Christ patiently listens when you turn to him, you are to be pa a patient listener in a hurried world. As Christ has broken down the barriers that separated you from God, you are to help heal divisions wherever you find them 
and strive to make people whole. As the Spirit of Christ has given you skills and abilities from your birth, you are to use your skills and talents to help those people whom you serve and to pray for them and with them. As Christ has shown his care to you, you are to help this congregation grow as a caring community through your own care. If it is your desire, please answer yes with the help of God to the following questions. Are you willing to accept the responsibilities you have been charged with? Yes, with the help of God. Are you willing to nurture the skills you have learned and use them in service to others to support, encourage, build up, and comfort people in all their needs? Now we charge you as members of First Presbyterian Church to open your hearts to the ministry of these people and to pray with them that they may be, may be effective servants of Christ. Are you prepared to accept this charge? If so, please answer yes with the help of God. Yes. We also ask you to accept their ministry when you need help to allow these individuals to work with you as you face struggles in your life, that you might receive support and help from your Christian brothers and sisters. If you are prepared to accept this ministry, please answer yes with the help of God. Yes. Are you prepared to serve as Stephen ministers in First Presbyterian Church? Because you have now promised faithfully to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and his people as Stephen ministers, I commend you to the care and guidance of the Holy Spirit as you in turn care for others. Work hard. Use the skills that you have learned, releasing the gifts and talents of the Spirit of God which have been given to you in order that you might be a blessing to the people you meet and care for. Continue to study. Reflect upon the situations you encounter. Pray for and with the people whose lives you are privileged to share. Act boldly and without fear, for Christ is with you. Let us now look to God in prayer as we commit these new Stephen ministers to his care. Let us pray. Our God, take our sisters, Helen Ayers, Mariana Person, and Margaret Toman, and our brother James Wright into your care. You've blessed them with particular gifts and talents and have provided them with an opportunity to learn more about helping people. May they serve you in the power of the Holy Spirit, being quick to serve, patient in listening, willing to share themselves with people. Give to us thankful hearts for them and show them in times of stress and satisfaction a special measure of your mercy and joy. Keep them strong in their faith that you have given them for the sake of Jesus Christ, who cares for us all in every way forever. Amen. And now to you, new Stephen ministers, as you begin your ministry. May you see the presence of Jesus Christ in all people and be moved as you would care for Jesus Christ himself. And may the who has graciously called you to be his disciple, now strengthen you by his spirit for your ministry in and to his church and to his world. Amen. And we invite you, the members of the congregation, to stay for a few moments at the close of the service to come forward to the chancel area to welcome these new Stephen ministers to their work and to congratulate them on the completion of that long course of study. Thank you very much.
Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian. I invite you to reach for one of the friendship pads on the center aisle. Please sign and pass that along the pew, and when it reaches the end, pass it back, observing the names of those worshiping with you this Sunday morning. A special welcome to our guests and visitors with us this Sunday. If you are so inclined, there is in the pew rack a card with a red ribbon. If you are inclined, please put that on so that worshipers in front of you or behind you may extend to you a most cordial welcome this Sunday morning. A special welcome as well to those of you who worship with us by way of WYED-TV. We are First Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we're located across from the state capitol, and we are privileged this Sunday that you are partners with us in this service of worship. We're thankful for your participation, for your prayers, and for your financial contributions, which help to undergird this special ministry. If you're a guest to visit in the sanctuary this Sunday, we invite you to stay for a few minutes at the close of the service for coffee in the Balkan Parlor. This is a room to my right, to your left, as you would exit. There will be officers present there. The pastors will go there after we greet at the doors. And we look forward to the opportunity of chatting with you at the close of the service. If you're interested in additional information about this congregation and would like to explore becoming a member of this body of Christ through First Presbyterian, uh, there's a place to check on the Friendship Pad your interest in receiving information. And if you want more detailed information, there's an elder present each Sunday in the Anderson's room, which is 
a room to the right of the pulpit. And that individual is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member of the Presbyterian Church through this congregation by transfer of letter, by reaffirmation of faith, or by profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'll call your attention to the announcements in the worship bulletin, particularly to those on the back page. Next Sunday, we honor Dee Campbell and Lisa Clevenger Nance. Dee Campbell for her 15 months of service as the Minister's Assistant for Visitation and uh, Lisa Clevenger Nance as our Interim Coordinator of Christian Education. Uh, they complete their duties with us at the end of this month, and so next Sunday, following the first worship service and before and during the first part of church school, there will be a coffee in Memorial Hall on the kitchen side, and you're invited uh, to be part of this saying of thank you to Dee Campbell and to Lisa Nance. Assuming duties as of February the 1st, as the minister's assistant for visitation will be Mrs. Martha Moore, assisted by Trisha, Patricia Wallace, and we're thankful for their assisting in this valuable way. And the new director of Christian education, who begins with us February the 1st, is Mrs. Sheila Spruill Barrick. And there's detailed information about her on the back of the worship bulletin and a much more detailed article in the issue of the newsletter, which you shall receive next week. So we welcome Sheila to the staff of First Presbyterian Church beginning February the 1st. In addition, uh, we encourage you, if you have not uh, signed up to have your pictures taken for the pictorial directory, that you do so. There are still uh, uh, slots for you to have uh, your picture taken by the photographers, and we'd like to have as many of our units in the directory as possible so that this will indeed be a church pictorial directory, a community of faith which, in which we are able to recognize members by name as well as by face. The All Church Retreat continues to receive registrations. We are at approximately uh, 265 reservations for the weekend 48-hour retreat at Montreat, North Carolina, and you are encouraged to participate in this very wonderful and warm experience as we learn fellow members in the church and have fun, fellowship, inspiration over a weekend. There's a congregational meeting on next Sunday following the 11 o'clock worship service in concordance with the Book of Order for the annual report of the session, the treasurer, to endorse the budget as approved by the officers and to approve any changes in the call to the pastors which must be reported to Presbytery. Our Christian sympathy is extended to individuals listed in the worship bulletin who have lost loved ones. During the church school hour, uh, Holly West called in to report the death of Tommy West's mother, uh, Mrs. Mary West. Uh, there will be details in the newspaper tomorrow morning. And uh, Holly was having to leave to drive immediately to Wilmington because of the severe illness of her father who was admitted to hospital. So, let us remember all these individuals in our thoughts and our prayers this Sunday morning. So I'd like to invite all the children to come forward for a moment with the children. They got plenty of room up front. We just got through watching what they call the commissioning of Stephen ministers. Commissioning was where those people have agreed to do something. And there's a difference between being a member of a committee and doing something and being a commissioner and doing something. See, the difference is a committee member is appointed to go and do something like go find out about what it would take to build the gym at the church. And they would go do that stuff and they'd come back and somebody else would build it. But if you commission them, you tell them to go and actually build it, do the work itself. And those Stephen ministers you just now saw have agreed to do something, not just go study and talk about something, but they've agreed to go help other people, to find people who have problems or difficult times or situations they need help with. And they weren't just to go find them and come tell us as ministers. That'd be like a committee member. Instead, they're commissioners now. They're actually supposed to go and help that person. 
The Bible tells us that Jesus commissioned his disciples, told them not just to go and find people who need to know about God's love and come back and tell Jesus who they were, but Jesus told them to actually go out, find those people, and then they tell those people how much God loves them. So they were commissioned to go and do things, not just to go find people and that kind of stuff. The Stephen ministers are going to find people who need help, and they're going to do what they can to help them, spend time talking with them or listening to them, doing things for them if they can. And that's what they do to try to show they love those people. You are Christians, and that means you're followers of Christ, you're disciples. You've decided you want to understand who Jesus is and try to love him more fully and follow his teachings. But instead of just being a Christian by title, you want to do something about that. You want to do something to show that love. What are some ways you can do that by showing love to some other people? How can you show that love to others as a Christian? Could you hug them? Do you like getting hugs? Kind of. Some people do and some people don't. Hugging a person is a way you show you care about them. If a person's had a hard time or hadn't done a very good job, you can you know, tell them how much you think they have done that's good. Be a friend to them. If a person's done a good job, you pat them on the back and say, good job. That's being a friend, being somebody who shows your love. There are a lot of ways you can do that. The main way is to understand that God loves you. Do you believe that? Do you believe God loves you? Do you believe God loves all people? Anybody. You may even do bad things at times as well as good things, and God still loves you. So if God loves you and God loves other people, how many times do you think other people might not understand that God loves them? Quite often. Some people may not know God loves them. If you want to be a good Christian, the main way to do that by doing something as a commissioner is to go out and tell them that God loves them and tell them that they have God's love and can find more of that. That's what it means to be a Christian is to go and say, I believe in Christ and I want you to know who Christ is. And disciples, the followers of Jesus, were commissioned to go and do that. And at the end of the book of the Bible, called Matthew, Jesus says, Go therefore into all the world, baptizing everyone in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. In other words, he told us what to do, and he said, Go teach them that stuff. He didn't say, Go find those people and come back and tell me who they are. He said, You go do it. So if we're going to be Christians, I want to commission you to be a Christian right now. I want you to answer a few questions. Do you believe God loves you? Yes. Yes. Do you believe God loves everybody? Yes. Are you willing to do what you can to show that you love other people in God's name? Yes. Go, therefore, and do that. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to understand the message of the Bible, that we are to understand that you love us, and to share that with people who don't know that message of good news. Give us the strength to go now into the world, love other people in your name, and remember that you love us in Jesus Christ. In his name we make this prayer, and let all of us say, Amen. Thank you. hear the word of God now as we read first from the Psalter, from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake and the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of, of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. We continue our scripture reading as we turn to the pages of the New Testament to Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, reading verses 1 through 10. Again, hear the word of God. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. May God bless to our understanding and to our deepening spiritual enrichment this reading of his holy word. Let us again look to our God in prayer. O oh Lord God, rightly interpret to us your word of truth, that we may be doers of that word and not hearers only. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There is an arresting biblical admonition tucked away here in this scripture passage that we've just read. It's a very appropriate one for us to hear on this particular Sunday when we have just commissioned four new Stephen ministers to work in our church. I want you to listen again and pay very careful attention to the impact and implication of these words from Galatians 6 verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, we all have burdens, or at least we will have burdens if we live long enough. Some of our burdens are going to be the result of our own sins and failures, our wrong choices and short-sighted decisions. Whenever we've made bad choices and decisions, whenever we've been disobedient to the will of God, most often we have to deal with the consequences of those choices. As Paul reminds us in these Bible verses that we've just read, do not be deceived, for you reap whatsoever you sow. Now in cases like that, what we need more than anything else is forgiveness. We need someone with a loving and forgiving heart to hear our confession, to be a mediator of God's love and grace and to restore us with the spirit of gentleness. Now, sometimes the burdens we bear are imposed upon us by the sins and failures of people around us. Quite often, they are some of the people dearest to us and closest to us. For example, some of you today, even after many years, may be bearing a burden from your parents' divorce or from their alcoholism or from their abuse of you in some way in childhood. And then frequently, we're called upon to bear burdens not through any fault of our own, not as the result of the sins or failures of some other specific person, but simply because it's the price that we have to pay for living in our kind of very imperfect world. Not a one of us is exempt from the basic human dilemma of the potential to frailty and sickness, to injustice and conflict. We all have to deal with certain natural events like tornadoes and floods and fires and earthquakes, 
just like the one that hit California last week. And then there are economic events like recessions and depressions, which cause us to lose our job or cause us to have a decline in our income. There are medical events like chronic illnesses or handicaps or endogenous mental disease. There are all sorts of accidents and crises and disasters arising out of all sorts of situations over which we have absolutely no control. As Rabbi Kushner reminded us in his best-selling selling book of a few years ago, some bad things are going to happen to some pretty good people from time to time. But whatever their source, these burdens are going to impact every aspect of our being. Often they threaten the very fabric of our existence. And sometimes their weight is so heavy to bear that we almost feel like giving up and giving in to absolute despair. How do you handle your burdens? Some of us, perhaps many of us, try to carry our burdens alone. We make a valiant effort to be independent and self-sufficient. We try to keep that stiff upper lip and to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps mentally and emotionally. Oftentimes we suffer in silence alone all the while wishing that some good Samaritan passing by might take note of our agony and stop just for a little while to help us to carry our load. In cases like this, what we need is to admit that there are some burdens in life which come to us which are too heavy to carry alone. And what we need in times like that more than anything else is someone to care someone to take a corner of the burden, to lift its weight from our shoulders just for a little while so that we might be able to make it through the crisis. And what a difference it could make to us if someone were there to listen, to care for us, to help us and support us during our time of struggle. And I'm convinced and it seems certain to me that this is why the Apostle Paul writing here in Galatians chapter 6, commands us with this biblical admonition, bear one another's burdens. For you see, God did not create us to live independent and isolated lives, separated from the love and support of others. The Bible reminds us again and again that we are intended by God to support each other amid the vicissitudes of human experience in our imperfect world. That's why Jesus commanded his disciples, strengthen your brothers and sisters. That's why the apostle James in the New Testament commanded, pray for one another. That's why Paul in another place wrote to the Christians at Rome, you then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And that's why Jesus in another place gave us a command with a promise, inasmuch as you do it, to the least of these, my beloved, you have done it unto me. And this, says Paul, is the way that we Christians today can fulfill the law of Christ. But what is this law of Christ? What rule, what command has he laid down for us as his disciples? Well, I don't think Paul is referring here to the Ten Commandments. Now, granted, they're essential because they speak of our duties to God and humanity. They're, fo they're foundational for our legal and social systems. They lend order and structure to our human existence. They're vitally important, and Jesus supports them to the ultimate. But Jesus said there is still a higher law, even than the commandments. He says there are two great commandments which encompass the totality of God's law. The first and great commandment is this, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This, he says, is the supreme goal of your life. And there is a second commandment likened to it. He says, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And these two commandments, our Lord says, summarize all of the divine directives 
that are delivered to us in the pages of the Torah, the law in the Old Testament, and were delivered to us through the prophets writing in the Old Testament. But, says Jesus, I am not even willing to stop at that point for he told his disciples and he tells us, I am going to add beyond that a new commandment. A new commandment I give you, he says, that you should love one another as I have first loved you. So this is the standard by which we are to measure our lives, to love each other as our Lord Jesus Christ has first loved us. This is the pattern by which we're to build our church and our homes and our world. But how could we, sinful, weak, flawed human beings, possibly learn to love one another as God has loved us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ? Because we know that Jesus loved us so freely and completely and sacrificially that he took up his cross and went to Mount Calvary, there to die as a sacrifice for the sins of not only us, but the whole world. How could we ever love in that self-giving, absolutely sacrificial manner? Well, I think Paul catches a vision when he offers this commandment, this admonition, that he's added to that phrase, bear one another's burdens, when he says, this is the way you fulfill the law of Christ. And I think Paul is implying here that we bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill that law of Christ's love when we support one another, not with glorious statements or promises, but in simple, basic, loving, down-to-earth, practical ways. And St. Augustine, the great saint of the early church, caught the vision as he studied this passage, and he described what this kind of love would look like. He says it will have hands to help others. It will have feet to hasten to the poor and the needy. It will have eyes to see misery and want. It will have ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of people. Do you see Augustine's point? It's the same message that Paul is delivering to us. The new kind of love that Jesus is commanding is the kind of love that looks just like an ordinary human person who is ready and willing to help someone bear a burden in their time of need. And as Christians, we all have the potential in our own unique places and ways to help carry the problems of others and thus together to carry the burdens of all. Now, our Stephen ministry volunteers here at First Presbyterian Church are some of the people in this congregation who have caught the vision of that way of love, and they have declared themselves willing to search out its implications in their service to others. Our Stephen minister volunteers are ordinary people, weak, flawed, and imperfect sinners, just like all of us here in this church today. They don't claim to have all of the answers, but by the grace of God, they've been given something of the heart of Jesus Christ to help, and they have been willing to learn some basic skills necessary in helping others in the most practical and useful ways possible. They have said, we will devote our time for study and learning and equipping. We will work and we will grow and we will serve using those new skills and developing those skills that we might become even better in this business of bearing another's burdens. For one thing, our Stephen ministers have gained skills in identifying and sharing feelings. You know, this is an area where hurt most often takes place and where healing usually is necessary. Many of us have learned that uh, perhaps we shouldn't share feelings, and most of us really aren't very comfortable with sharing our feelings with other people, but we know that emotions are part and parcel of life, and some emotions are heavy burdens that we have to bear. Emotions such as fear and anxiety, and sorrow and disappointment and anger and guilt. But you know, there are other positive emotions given us by God 
which when they are shared can bring healing and the lifting of a burden. Emotions such as love, joy, peace, patience, trust. Our Stephen ministers are learning to replace those negative emotions with those God-given positive emotions. They're learning how to use that precious treasure to lift the burdens of those who are emotionally weighted down. And our Stephen ministers are learning to listen, too. They have learned that listening accurately and perceptively is very hard work. Real listening, of course, is necessary, though, before any movement to make a change or any advice can be given. Stephen ministers try to listen in the very same way that Jesus listened to his disciples in their moments of folly and failure as well as in their times of deep and anguished need. Perceptive listening is not a skill that we're born with. Not all of us know how to listen very well. Not all of us have the patience to listen. At least Stephen ministers are struggling and trying to learn. And then our Stephen ministers are learning to keep confidences. We've all observed those people in or outside the church, those sanctimonious souls who, under the guise of helpfulness, have relished the opportunity perhaps to do a little gossiping. And they've said, have you heard about so-and-so? And And Mr. or Mrs. Long Ears on the other end will perk up and say, tell me all about it. But Stephen, ministers don't behave in that way. They've learned that trust and confidentiality are essential to a genuine helping relationship. Bearing another person's burden is a serious responsibility, and confidentiality and trust have got to be preserved. So our Stephen ministers, both those who are newly commissioned and those who have been serving for months and even years, are growing. They're gaining insights, learning new skills in order to do a better job of carrying one another's burdens and thus fulfilling the law of Christ's love. We're thankful for the work that the Stephen ministers have done and will do in the ministry of our congregation, but we must never forget also that we all have our part in this biblical command to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. It takes us all to share the tremendous load of a large and varied congregation like this one. I think that important point is so wonderfully illustrated by a story that's recounted in the second chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus was one day teaching in a house in Capernaum. His message was so appealing and popular that a large crowd had gathered, packing the house with so many people that it was like that proverbial can of sardines. No one could get in. But there was a handicapped man bearing a heavy burden of quadriplegia who wanted more than anything else to come into the presence of Jesus and plead that he might be healed of his paralysis. But the man had no ability to get to Jesus. He he could not even drag himself. And besides, the press of the crowd was too great. The situation looked helpless. But then... There was a burden-bearing team of four men who devised a radical and creative solution. They climbed up on the roof of the house and began to tear away one by one the tiles from off that roof until they had made an opening large enough through which they could lower this poor man on his pallet down into the presence of Jesus where he was teaching inside. And so they hoisted the man up on the roof and then tied ropes to the four corners of his pallet and each one on a corner lowered him down into the presence of our Lord. How amazed the people in that room must have been. But even more amazed they were when Jesus healed the man of his paralysis and more than that, he forgave his sins. And the man stood up and lifted up his pallet and walked away a whole and new man that day. No single individual of those four could have gotten their friend to Jesus. I don't even believe that two or three of them could have done it. It took four, four men, each one carrying a corner of the load, 
to accomplish that miracle that day. And the same principle is true if we Christians are going to be serious about fulfilling this law of Christ to bear one another's burdens. Your pastors can't do it all. The needs are too great and too widespread, too many. Ministers, most of them go to bed every night realizing that there were so many things, so many needs that they could not possibly address that day. And it's that way day in and day out. But let me tell you that you, your elders and your deacons and your Sunday school classes can't do it all. The pastor's visitation assistant can't do it all. Even the Stephen ministers, as many as there are in the hard work that they do, can't do the complete job. And God did not intend for any group or individual to do it. The admonition is to all of us. We must all be involved, doing our unique and individual part to share the load of God's people so that together all of us may participate in bearing one another's burdens and thus fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ. In the next 12 months, some of your dear friends here at First Presbyterian Church are going to find their life interrupted in some very difficult ways. For some, it will be serious illness, hospitalization for the long term. For others, it might be terminal illness. Others will lose a loved one in death, a spouse or a child or a parent. Others will face the loss of their job, personal conflict, marital conflict. Others will go through a time of deep emotional depression or a grief that just doesn't seem to go away. So many, many things are going to happen within this circle of First Presbyterian Church in the next 12 months. And it just might be possible for you to help bear a burden. You can go and offer your love. You can become a support, a friend, a caring friend, a prayer partner, and in that way, bear that burden. It might be important for a number of you to volunteer to become Stephen ministers, to go through the training and to go through that kind of service so that you might equip yourselves and enhance your burden-bearing skills. But whatever the case, we all need to do our part to carry our common load, for in that way, we can all work together to fulfill that important biblical command and admonition, bear one another's burdens, for in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ's love. Amen. We have heard God's word and we've received God's blessings. Let us respond in faith by saying what we believe is in the Apostles' Creed. Let's do it. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. this time, let us unite our hearts and our minds in common prayer. Again, let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we come before you again this day to give you the glory and to sing your praises. We come before you as people who recognize the blessings of your presence in our world and seek more of that blessing. 
We seek fullness of life, the completion of your spirit, and the knowledge of your work within our lives. Indeed, dear God, we are grateful for many things, and we lift those prayers up to you as we count our blessings. But we also come before you asking your need, our help. We need your help, and we ask, therefore, in this prayer and all our prayers, for your grace, your understanding, compassion, and mercy. For God, as we count our blessings, we also recognize those times in our lives when the blessings seem few, when the doubt seems strong, when the fear seems overwhelming. As much as we have recognized and accept your blessings, give us the presence of mind to see through the moment that there is indeed a, a bright time ahead, that the promises of the Scripture are full and strong, that we might know that we too will one day be lifted up by your Spirit. Almighty God, we count our blessings, we look at what we've been given, and we are thankful as a people. But we also ask that as we lift up our prayers, you hear our individual concerns and requests. For each of us has needs that you know of before we know them. We ask now that you hear our prayers, receive our complaints, our pleas, our needs, our doubts, and worries. And lift them from our shoulders and help us to know that you have borne our burdens on your shoulders as the Son of God, the, the Christ, the Messiah. Help us to share one another's burdens as we have seen you share ours. But most of all, dear God, this day with whatever we face, help us to know that we are not alone, that through your spirit and presence, we might indeed know that the promise of Christ is true, that you love us and have shown that love in Jesus Christ. Dear God, all these things and more we ask in his name, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time, let us receive our tithes and our offerings.
We ask also that we know your life in us, your life through Jesus Christ, that together with these gifts and our works may be lifted up to the kingdom of God in his name. And all his glory, all his honor, may we praise you through this prayer and all our gifts. In his name we make this prayer. Amen. Our hymn is number 304, the first and last verses of O Master, Let Us Walk With Thee. Go forth from God's house today knowing that you have been unconditionally loved by God in Jesus Christ. Go forth to love as Christ has first loved you. Go forth to fulfill the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.